Ja, wir kommen jetzt zum wissenschaftlichen Teil. Äh, and now I'm going to shift the language to the scientific part. Uh, before I, I give the word to, uh, to Professor Lindler, I have to announce uh, uh, some amendments uh, of the program which uh, were uh, decided due to we had very exciting developments uh, in, the, in the experimental um, research in, in gravity. In fact, after uh, the program had been completed, uh, in uh, mid-April at the meeting of the American Society, the research of the gravity flow experiments, which uh, had uh, as one of the main goals uh, the investigation of the Nancy Tilling effect, which is an effect which was predicted by Walter's father and his uh, collaborator Lenz uh, almost 90 years ago. These first results were announced. And at the initiative of Walter, it was possible to, uh, to get uh, one of the principal investigators of this uh, uh, experiment, uh, Dr. Barry Mufelter from Stanford, to come here. We are very grateful that you make a long way from California to here to to, uh, to give us an account of this uh, experiment. He will give a lecture tomorrow in this hall. It is announced here uh, everywhere at uh, quarter past seven. But there will uh, there will in fact uh, be in addition to that a short presentation, 10-15 minutes uh, this afternoon after the lecture of Elliot Lee. Also, uh, for the same reason of this experiment, uh, uh, Professor Rindler uh, has changed his uh, title slightly. And now the uh, title is uh, Vienna, Hans, Thiering and Gravity Probe B. All these distinguished speakers of this symposium are so well known that I think I will not use the previous time here to uh, uh, give an account of their merita and vita. And I will just pass the word over to Professor Winter.
Maybe I'll get with the title on the screen. Um, and yet, this year, 2007, if it is the year of tearing, it's really also the year of another tearing, of Hans tearing, Walter tearing's father. His name is forever associated with one of the more subtle properties of Einstein's general relativity, namely the field of a rotating body like the Earth, so-called gravity magnetic field. And in fact, for the last 43 years, the American Space Agency, NASA, in collaboration with Stanford University, has spent something approaching $800 million preparing for one of the most ambitious and most elegant and most delicate physics experiments of all time, named gravity probe B, which will, fi which will finally come to fruition this year. Uh, its purpose was to test the so-called, yeah, I could probably do better without this one. Thanks very much. Thank you. Shall I take it off all the as I say, uh, NASA has been busy for the last 43 years preparing this enormously delicate experiment in gravity probe B in collaboration with Stanford University and some 3,000 engineers and physicists. Uh, its purpose is to test the so-called lenser tearing effect uh, by use of four of the most perfectly and perfectly manufactured, perfectly spherical gyroscopes ever manufactured uh, on Earth. Um, in April 2004, uh, the satellite with these gyroscopes was successfully launched. It circled the Earth every 50 minutes and it transmitted to Stanford, to the headquarters in Stanford, something like a million, million bytes of data information before it finally ran out of helium in September 2005. And since then, large teams of analysts were busy analyzing the data from that satellite. Uh, NASA had hoped to uh, announce the results of the experiment last April. And however, some unforeseen difficulties arose patches of static electricity on the gyroscopes whose modeling has delayed the data analysis by several months. And now the results are promised for December of this year. But nevertheless, they are confidently expected to confirm to unheard of accuracy the so-called lenser tearing effect. Uh, to return to Hans theory. Um, I have a picture of him. I'm sorry, it's not very good quality, but this is Hans Steering, uh, Walter Terry's father, and undoubtedly he was the most prominent Viennese relativist before the last war. He worked in the field of relativity, amongst other things, since 1918. And through his lectures and writings, he influenced many, many of his students to retain a lifelong interest in Einstein's theories. And amongst his students was the later famous logician Kurt Gödel. Terry, of course, had several colleagues who were also interested in relativity, amongst them people like Lenze, Hasenel, Kotler, Flam, just to mention a few. And also from Vienna, though from a much earlier generation, was the great Ernst Mach, who many years before Einstein referred to himself and his followers as, as relativists. And he was a great influence 
on Einstein. Um, after the trauma of the last war, Hans Thiering rebuilt his Viennese Institute of Theoretical Physics, a task which was later continued by his son Walter. And one of the offshoots of that institute was a world-class relativity group built up by Roman Sexel, which flourishes to this day. So Vienna surely deserves an honored place in the world map of relativity achievements. And this year, the year of Turing and of Graduate Pro B, the international physics community is acutely aware of that connection. It therefore seemed fit and proper that one of the talks in the symposium should be devoted to the fruits of Hans Thiering's work. Um, I'll put up an outline of what I intend to talk about. Uh, at the uh, basis of it all is Marx's principle. Uh, and I start with that. I talk about Marx's principle. I talk about the electromagnetic analogy between general relativity and Maxwell. I talk about the steering effect derived from this analogy, and then describe gravity flow B. And I'll end with two caveats: the caveat on Marx's principle, uh, and the caveat on this very popular paradigm of space dragging. Uh, at least, uh, I question briefly whether Marx's principle is correct, and I question briefly whether the idea of space dragging is, is correct, although that is a purely philosophical point that in no way, in no way influences the uh, validity of both the engineering and, of course, gravity flow B. Marx's principle uh, is elaborated by Einstein. It goes as follows. Uh, ever since Newton, the idea of absolute space was disliked. Newton himself apparently disliked the idea of absolute space, but had no idea how to do without it. Here's a criticism of, that, of absolute space, which Einstein describes to Mark, but the words are in fact Einstein's. Einstein says, it goes, it goes against the spirit of science to conceive of a thing, absolute space, that acts but cannot be acted on. And once you accept that criticism of absolute space, there are two ways you can go. One is the radical way of Mark to, act, to abolish absolute space altogether. Another is the way that Einstein can eventually win, and that is to make space space inferenceable, not absolute. In Einstein's theory, space has become a field, and it is influenced by, but also in return influences matter. However, Mark's principle, once you hear it, it's total abolition of absolute space. Once you hear it, it's very persuasive, it's a very beautiful idea. It's very persuasive. Einstein stuck to it for many, many years. He discarded it eventually. <coughs> and it's hard once you've swallowed it to let go of it. The people certainly are very attached to Marx's principle. And here is the way it goes. Uh, Marx said, and again the words are essentially Einstein's. Marx said space is not a thing at all. As people before had often put it. Mark, uh, space is not a thing. Space is merely the sum total of all the distance relations between matter. The second point is that only the relative motion between particles can possibly have physical significance. The third point is what takes the place of absolute space. Absolute, the role of absolute space was locally to determine the standard of non-rotation and non-acceleration. According to Mach, that local standard is now provided by some average of the motion and masses of in, in the entire universe. So the substitute for absolute space is some unfortunately unspecified influence of the distant masses, which determine here and now the properties of inertia. Lastly, an example, uh, consider a, an elastic sphere that spins about its axis fairly fast and bulges at the equator. Uh, Newton, if he were asked why does the sphere bulges at the equator, Newton would have said, well, the sphere feels absolute space, and it bulges. 
Mark would have said, the sphere looks around, sees the universe rotate around it, and the rotating universe around the sphere pulls out the equator. So there are two ways of looking at that. This is just an example. Now, many people think that Mark's principle is empty because uh, Mark simply said, well, there are all the properties of, of uh, inertia caused by the distant masses, but he doesn't say how, and how can you ever check whether the local inertia is caused by the distant masses or whether it's caused by absolute space. However, Mark's principle is not empty. Mark's principle actually leads to physical predictions. Uh, here's one kind of argument that one could lose. Uh, I've drawn, imagine, if it makes any sense at all, imagine a totally empty universe. This, this topic a totally empty universe, and I've drawn in that totally empty universe a lattice work of weightless rods, this, this, these blue things, uh, little weightless rods filling the entire space uh, all the way to infinity. There's nothing in that universe, but just that lattice. And supposing there is a rotating body like the Earth somewhere in the lattice, rotating very to the lattice, but there's nothing else in the universe. So, according to Mark, since there's nothing in other masses in the universe, if you had a proof of, so the, the Earth would be where this land is, if you had a proof of the universe at the North Pole, or if you had a gyroscope at the North Pole, evidently since the Earth is now the only standard of, of matter, that Foucault, the, the plane of the Foucault pendulum would rotate with the Earth, the axis of a, of a gyroscope would simply go with the Earth, there's no other standard. So they would go around together. And now imagine what happens when you gradually fill the universe, this lattice, just put stuff in, stars and galaxies, just more and more and more stuff. Uh, according to Mark, that stuff would take over as the determinant of local inertia. And the more stuff you put there, the Earth, of course, will keep on rotating. But of course, once you fill the universe completely full, it's the universe that determines the local properties of inertia. And eventually, the Foucault pendulum would just, the plane of the Foucault pendulum would just be at rest relative to this distant universe. However, as you can see, as you add more and more mass, it would slow the precession of the, of the Foucault pendulum. Say that you're looking down at the Earth at the North Pole. As you put more and more mass in, it would slow down the precession of the gyroscope. Eventually, it would stop it altogether, but it wouldn't ever quite totally succeed in stopping it, there would always be a slight, slight remnant of the influence of the Earth. So in other words, even once the whole universe is placed on that lattice, and the Earth now rotates relative to the universe, the Foucault pendulum, the plane of the Foucault pendulum, would be slightly, I've drawn a little error, the Earth rotates as before, but now the plane of the Foucault pendulum is slightly dragged by the Earth. Um, there's another, you, you can generalize this kind of an effect. For example, if before you, instead of putting a Foucault pendulum on the Earth, you took a satellite circling the Earth, say, polar orbit, then the rotation of the Earth, again, before you put the universe in, the plane of that polar orbit would be locked to the Earth. But as you put more and more universe in it, uh, the plane of the polar orbit, the plane of the orbit of the satellite would come to rest relative to the universe, but the, unit, the, the Earth would still drag, drag it with it very, very slightly. And that is, in fact, the Lenz and Turing effect. Lenz and Turing in 1918 worked out the precise the orbits of particles that go around a rotating body like the Earth, and they found that the rotation of the Earth drags the, or drags the plane of the orbit around with it. There's another effect. But in exactly the same way, you can prove it from Mark's principle that if you had, instead of a solid ball, if you had a hollow shell, and the hollow shell rotates in the universe, and you had a gyroscope at the center of that hollow shell, then the gyroscope again, at first before the universe was there, the gyroscope would be in lockstep with the, with the shell, but then as you have one more universe, there'd still be a slight remnant of the influence of that rotating shell, and the rotating shell would slightly drag the gyroscope in center, in spite of the universe out there with it. And that, in fact, was found by Hans Turing 
very insane effect. Inside the hollow shell, the Lancetarian paper in 1918, uh, just before the Lancetarian paper there. Um, interestingly enough, this is uh, rather amazing. Einstein, as I said before, Einstein was very taken with Mark's principle. In fact, for a long time he hoped that although Mark, Mark never specified how the universe is supposed to cause inertia, Einstein hoped very much that his general relativity would be the tool that tells how the distant masses determine inertia here yeah, now. This is now 1913. Einstein writes to Mark. Already 19, that's two years before he finally invented general relativity. But already in 1913, he had a vision of, he had, he had some idea of how general relativity was going to be, and he knew that these effects would exist. This is a letter that Einstein wrote in 1913 to Mark, whom he, for whom he had an enormous respect. Uh, he says, in these days, you have probably received my paper, uh, and then at the bottom he, say, and he says, he hopes that his theory will be verified, and he says at the bottom, then yeah, if yes, if you read my general relativity, it does get very high. Then a far away, then yeah, I want to suit him in the good line, the mechanic, and then your brilliant uh, investigations about the uh, principal mechanics will be finally verified, validated. Uh, and he glances into the air, it will be brilliantly validated. And then he goes out and in fact discusses this. He foresees the steering problem. He has a rotating shell that's all in, in the letter of 1913. And already Einstein knows that if you have a rotating shell, then inside that rotating shell, the gyroscope actually talks about a football pendulum inside there. The plane of the football pendulum, the aim in this pendulum get a bit phenomenon, bit phenomenon, drag. So Einstein was in fact the first one who used this word drag. Eventually, I'd like to come back to that idea of dragging. It's a sad, it, it, it's an unfortunate idea, but again, once you've seen it, once you've heard it, it it's so persuasive that you can't ignore it. But what's amazing is that this was done in 1913. Mach was old by that time. Mach, I think, was something like 76 years old, and apparently never replied to Einstein. It must be rather sad, because Einstein was enormously proud of having produced this result. Uh, let me just talk very briefly about general relativity. Uh, Einstein, as I said, was enormously influenced by Mach's principle. And at first, his theory seemed to validate many of the ideas that Mach had. I've written down here some differences between Einstein and Newton on the one hand and Maxwell on the other hand. In Newton's theory, the gravitational field is produced simply by the matter density. The density the density, whether the Earth rotates or not, the density of the, the, the matter, density of the Earth here, immediately determines the field out there, and whether the Earth rotates or not makes no difference whatsoever. Ever. Just the fact that there's mass here that determines the field out here in, in Newton's theory. In other words, the density rho is the only source of the gravitational field. In Einstein's theory, it's quite different. In Einstein's theory, there are 16 components to the source of the gravitational field. The source of the gravitational field is the so-called energy tensor of matter, which contains in one corner of it. It's actually symmetric, and so there are really only 10 independent components of this tensor. But nevertheless, it is this tensor in Einstein's theory that serves as the source of gravity and the density rho, that's essentially, essentially Newton's, the density rho is only one part of that. In Einstein's theory, the momentum, the motion of the matter, also has an influence on the field out there. And not only that, the stress of the matter, if you squeeze a ball, just the squeezing will affect the field out there. The squeezed ball has a different gravitational field from a not squeezed ball. So in, in other words, in, Newton, in Einstein's theory, there is this stress tensor, energy stress tensor, which is the source of the gravitational field. In particular, also, as I said, the momentum density matters, and a moving body has a different field from a static body. Halfway between these two theories, in, in, in Newton, only the mass matters, in Einstein, all the stuff matters. Halfway between is Maxwell's theory. Of course, it's not a theory of uh, 
gravity is a theory of electromagnetic electric charge. But in Maxwell's mathematically in that theory, similar in Maxwell's Maxwell's theory, the source is here's a scalar, here's a tensor, in Maxwell's theory, the source is a vector in four dimensions. So there are four components of Maxwell's theory. And this is, is the current um, with the four current density. Again, one of the principal components of it is the density of charge, and the other is the central momentum, what corresponds to momentum is the charge current density. So in Maxwell's theory, of course, as everybody knows, a moving charge produces a magnetic field. So a moving charge produces a field that's quite different from the stationary charge. Uh, what is interesting is that Einstein's theory, in first approximation, reduces to, uh, to, to uh, Newton's theory. In other words, in first approximation, these various terms don't matter very much. In first approximation, when the field is very weak and the sources move very slowly, Einstein reduces to Newton. And actually, Einstein would have discarded his theory if it had not worked out like that because Newton has been validated to an enormous degree of accuracy by classical celestial mechanics. So Newton's theory can't possibly be all wrong. And unless a new theory reproduces much of Newton, it couldn't possibly be right. So in first approximation, Einstein's theory reduces to Newton. But it's interesting that in the second kind of approximation, again, when the field is very weak and when the sources are moving very slowly, then Einstein's theory actually reduces to Maxwell's theory. And that's what's relevant for the lens and Turing problem. I have a slide here that shows the analogy between Einstein and Maxwell. Uh, in linearized general relativity, which is a, an approximation for general relativity, uh, you can prove what's important in general relativity is to find the space time. In general relativity, space and time lock together and they are curved by the sources in it. Uh, and once you know the curvature of space-time, then you know all the mechanics, then you know how free particles will move, free particles will move along geodesics in that space-time. So the, the key thing in general is to construct the space-time. Well, in Einstein's theory of the field, uh, the space-time looks like that, we can prove that. It looks actually rather like uh, in cosmic space, especially in the if these factors here, there's a 1 plus 2 phi here, and there's a 1 minus 2 phi, and there's a w here. But this phi is enormously small, and the w is enormously small. So this first factor is almost 1, and the second factor is almost 1, and this middle factor is almost not there. And if that is the case, then the metric reads dt squared minus the x and dy squared c squared, which is the metric of special relativity. The presence of weak sources changes that Minkowski metric slightly. And now you get two things in here, a so-called scalar potential phi, which multiplies these terms, and, and a vector potential wi, where in fact, and this is the interesting thing, where in fact the scalar potential is given by a formula like this, which is very reminiscent of the, of course, of the Newtonian formula, also, of, and also of the Maxwellian formula for the scalar potential, except there's a minus sign. <coughs> there's a scalar potential that enters into this metric, Defined by a potential that looks exactly like Maxwell's scalar potential. Here is this form in terms of electric charge, here is form in terms of mass density, but it's the same. The minus sign is very easily explainable because gravity is attracted and electricity, energy, electric, uh, electrostatics is this constant. So there's a minus sign and a plus sign here. Then there's a, this W, it's called the vector potential in the Einstein's theory, it's given by this form here. And that's a vector now, so that's momentum density in here. And the vector potential is formed in this way. In, in Maxwell's theory, it's like that. Charge, velocity of the charge. And there's a similarity again. The minus, the, the sign changes, that's clear, because attraction replaces uh, repulsion. The four can't be explained in a trivial way. The four comes from the field equation. But anyway, you have a metric. And in the metric, there's a scalar potential and a vector potential. And this is how they are defined. So this is very analogous to Maxwell. And once you have the metric, you can work out the geodesics in the metric. And you find something else that's nice. 
you find, you now have, you now have the center as I said before, is, is almost the cosmic space. You can think of it as the center of flat space. And in that flat space, as the free particle moves, this is how it moves. The, the acceleration of a free particle in that lattice turns out to be given by this formula, which is very, very analogous to the Lorentz force in Maxwell's theory. The Lorentz force in Maxwell's theory shows how a charge that moves straight is pushed sideways by the magnetic field. Because B, B is the velocity of the particle, B is the magnetic field, and the acceleration, if there's a magnetic field, in the electromagnetism, the particle is pushed sideways by the magnetic field. Interestingly enough, the same thing happens in general relativity. This is the acceleration relative to this gray band, the Kotskian lattice. Uh, Maxwell has a charge divided by mass. Einstein has a gravitational charge divided by gravitational mass. In other words, gravitational mass divided by inertial mass. They are the same in Newton's theory by some miracle. And since they are the same, that thing goes out altogether. And so you have no, no coefficient in front of this, in front of this uh, expression. But anyway, uh, E, you have, if you look at the GDC equations, this, you find the acceleration is that, where in fact E, just as in Maxwell's theory, is the gradient minus gradient you find E is the curve of W. So there's this, the analogy between Maxwell and Einstein for four weak fields assists down to that level. Here's an example. An example of using that analogy. Uh, a rotating ball, there's a rotating ball of charge uh, at the top. And in Maxwell's theory, it's very easy. So if you have a, a ball of radius r, total charge q, it's rotating about an axis with an angle of velocity omega. And you're interested in what's the field out here at vector distance little r from the center. And well, obviously, the, uh, obviously for those people who know, uh, obviously the, the potential is Q over R, and that's the scalar potential, and the vector potential is given by this very well known formula. That's the vector potential of a rotating ball in Maxwell's theory. And once you know that, it, you immediately translate into general relativity. You don't have to start from scratch. You simply rotate this. We know we need a minus sign there, so and charge becomes mass. So. The total charge of the ball is now replaced by the total mass. Uh, and you have the same kind of function with minus sign. And again, the gravitational vector potential is gotten from the vector potential max, or so putting a minus 4 in front, as we've learned before. And so you get this corresponding thing here. But of course, in, in, in uh, general relativity, charge is replaced by mass. And if you replace this charge by mass here, you find something that's actually the moment of inertia of the ball. And so it turns out that this W has something to do with the moment of inertia of the ball, and then the same OB across R uh, is it. Anyway, so here you have quite easily, simply by that analogy, you have the phi and the W that you need to put into the metric, and you plug that into the metric that we had before, and you get this metric. And that's precisely the metric, in other words, the form of space-time around the rotating ball of matter, this is precisely the form of the metric that Lenz and Thierry obtained in 1918. Of course, he didn't know it then, but Kerr, uh, Roy Kerr in 1963, actually discovered the exact metric around the, well, probably the exact metric around the rotating black hole anyway. So uh, one thinks it's essentially the metric around any rotating Body and so what Lenz and Thierry in fact discovered was a linearized version of the 1963 curve metric. So they, they already had that in, in 1918. And they used this metric to do the rest of their work. It's interesting, Hans Thierry knew about this electromagnetic analogy. In fact, he published a paper later about this electromagnetic analogy. But Lenz and Thierry did not derive their metric in this way, but they actually went, went the hard way via the uh, Einstein field equation. Um, let me talk briefly about the meaning of the so-called gravity electric field and the gravity magnetic field, these analogs of the Maxwellian uh, concepts. Supposing we have a, we are now in, in, uh, in uh, approximative uh, flat space. In the, in the very weak field, the 
the space time is essentially flat, it's essentially the costumes are drawn in, in a slightly curved way. So we're sitting in this slightly curved lattice, and what's the meaning of even B? Well, supposing I sit at one point in the lattice, the meaning of E is very clear. E is minus, by definition, E is minus the gradient of phi. And then, of course, we, we know what phi is, and we know from Newton's theory that it's the gravitational field. So E, this grandly electric field, is simply the gravitational field at that point. But then there's also the B field, the gravity magnetic B field at any point in the lattice. And then there's this gravity Lorentz force. So if the particle, even this now is gravitation, not electricity, but even in gravitation, the particle goes straight, it gets pushed sideways by the gravity magnetic field. So the first interpretation of the gravity magnetic field B is that it pushes the particle sideways. Now, in uh, classic mechanics, we know forces that push things sideways. There is in classic mechanics one particular force that pushes you sideways. When you try to, when you try to restrain, it pushes you sideways, and that's the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force in a rotating lattice, if you have now a rotating lattice, in classic mechanics, and you try and go straight with the velocity d, you find there's a force pushing you sideways, and that's the Coriolis force, F, and it has this form. So the Coriolis force is given by twice the velocity, vector product, with the rotation, but this is the angular velocity of the lattice. So living on a rotating lattice, you have this force that pushes you sideways. If you now compare this Coriolis force with the, with the gravity, Lorentz force up here, you find in fact what this B field really represents is the rotation of your lattice. So that's another interpretation of the B field. It pushes you sideways precisely because your lattice is rotating. So you just now interpret, comparing these two formulas, you find that the B field is only a factor of two in the previous field. So the B field is essentially the same as the omega of rotating lattice. So B is actually twice the angular velocity of the lattice locally, or, of course, if, if the lattice, in classic mechanics, if the lattice rotates, that means it rotates relative to inertial space at that point. And the inertial space is fixed by a gyroscope. So if you have a gyroscope sitting in a lattice, this omega measures the rotation of the lattice relative to the gyroscope. So if omega is the rotation of the lattice relative to the gyroscope, minus omega is the rotation of the gyroscope relative to the lattice. So another way of putting it is to say that if, if you put a gyroscope in your lattice, and that's very, very important, that's the key idea of this entire lens theory and, and the theory effect, that if you put a gyroscope in your lattice, then the gyroscope actually precesses and the precession, angular velocity of the gyroscope is simply related to that B field in, in this way that the gyro velocity, angular velocity is minus a half the B field. There's another way of getting that, but uh, I, I won't actually go into that. The main thing is to realize this second significance of the B field as a rotation of either the gyroscope relative to the lattice or the rotation of the lattice relative to the gyroscope with minus a half. Once you know that, it's interesting to look at the field, the gravity, electric and gravity magnetic field around the rotating body. And previously I, I wrote down the Maxwell, Maxwell formulas for the potential. Now here are the Maxwell formulas, this is just the Maxwell formula. I have a rotating ball of charge, total charge Q, radius R, angular velocity, little omega, and a position vector R. I want to, I want to find the field out here. Well, in Maxwell's theory, one knows that the B field of such a rotating bar is given by that. And then I can simply translate that directly to gravitation, weak, weak gravitation. And as before, I simply multiply the Maxwell expression by minus 4. So there's the Maxwell expression, and that I replace, of course, charge by mass. So it now becomes the gravity magnetic, the gravity magnetic field around the rotating ball. Now, M would be the mass of the ball, it takes the place of the charge of the ball, and it's given by this thing, and again, there's a relation between the M and R squared and the moment of inertia of the ball. So you find, you find that the gravity magnetic field of the rotating ball is very much 
the pattern is very much the same as a magnetic field of rotating ball and charge. Now, the magnetic field of rotating ball and charge, if the ball rotates this way, the magnetic field lines come out at the top. The gravity magnetic field lines come in because it's a, there's a minus sign. So this is the, this is the pattern of the gravity magnetic field around the rotating ball. This is the gravity magnetic field that it comes out, it comes in at the top, goes out at the bottom, and then there's these loops at the side. And actually, uh, Lenz and Terry didn't talk about gyroscopes, but here, Lenz and Terry were particularly interested in what happens if you have a rotating ball and you have planets or whatever uh, orbiting around orbiting around the thing at the center. It was Schiff, I think, for the first time, because in 1960 people had developed enormously accurate gyroscopes, and Schiff was working with those gyroscopes at Stanford, and he realized that this work of Lenz and Terry could really be interpreted nicely in terms of gyroscope. So if you think uh, a rotating ball surrounded by a lattice, and you put gyroscopes anywhere, then the gyroscope rotates, uh, as we said, said as talked before, the gyroscope rotation anyway in this field is simply minus a half the B field. And so placing a gyroscope anywhere in the field of rotating ball, you know by how much the gyroscope will actually process. And as I say, the way of getting it is rather easy by that electromagnetic analogy. Um, here are some gyroscopes around the rotating Earth. Uh, there's a rotating ball. Uh, I'm now looking at the Earth. Let's say that's the Earth. I'm looking at the North Pole. I'm looking down at the Earth. And this is the equatorial plane of the Earth. And I'm Surrounding the Earth by some lattice, and at the moment nothing is, there's no there's no satellite going around. It's just a lattice around the Earth. The Earth is rotating. If I put a gyroscope here, then if you remember the pattern of the B field, the B field goes in here, uh, comes in and comes out here. But the B field coming out, I'm sorry, uh, the B field goes in here, and the rotation field. Uh, goes comes out here. So the actual rotation of the gyroscope at that point is, is precisely in, in this direction. The, the Earth rotates this way, and if you put a gyroscope into the into the uh, lattice, the gyroscope will rotate in this direction. Uh, now, instead of putting a gyroscope in the uh, in in the lattice, which you can't really do if you have the Earth, it would be nice if you had a huge uh, lattice around the Earth. And you could actually put a gyroscope at rest in the lattice. Which can do. So what you can do is you have to have that you have that gyroscope in a satellite and have it circular, say in the equatorial plane. Then everywhere in the equatorial plane, of course, the B field is the same, and therefore the, the precession of the gyroscope is the same. And you simply add it up. Uh, the motion of it uh, in, in a linearized theory, you can simply add things up. So by the time the gyroscope comes around. It would have precessed by a certain amount, which is just the time it took to get around practice over However, there's a complication. In general relativity, if you send a particle, a gyroscope, around an orbit, around, around, an orbit, around any ball whatsoever, um, do you have another? In, in general, if you, if you send if you send a particle around uh, a straight of mass, there is another precession, which is a precession of a gyroscope that's totally different from this gravity magnetic effect. It's a curvature effect. It's rather a large curvature effect. So, in, in other words, it, it's called the Nisette effect, the effect of geodetic precession. Any orbit, whether this thing in, in, in the center rotates or not, any 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 gyroscope that orbits a straight of mass. Uh, precesses in a certain way, and the precession action, this simple precession or the uh, geodetic precession, is much larger than the Lenz-Terry precession. It's about 100 times larger. So, if you actually took a satellite going round the Earth in an equatorial plane, there would be this huge simple precession in, it's not huge because it's still minute, but huge compared to the Lenz-Terry, it's about 170 times as big as the Lenz-Terry. 
it goes this way, the less you can set it goes that way. So, for example, as, it, as, as, as you send the satellite around, there will be this, this thing, you completely swamp that one, and it will be a very complicated experiment. So, what is in fact done, so as to avoid conflict with this very large Pacific recession, is to send the gyroscope in a polar orbit. Here is the polar orbit. It, it makes the physics a lot easier, it makes the mathematics a lot harder. Uh, because if you send a gyroscope in the polar orbit, then the B field is in the polar orbit, because the strength of the B field is the same anywhere in, in the equatorial plane, and so you can simply add it up. If you send a gyroscope in the polar orbit around the rotating body, the B field changes. This is actually not minus the B field, this is the orbital field, the field of perception of the gyroscope. So these are the field lines of omega, and as the gyroscope now goes, same center gyroscope in a polar orbit inside the satellite. Uh, down here, the gyroscope will be made to precess by the gravimagnetic field in this direction. As it moves out, the direction of the gravimagnetic field changes. In fact, as it comes up, there's a, a torque going the other way. So the gyroscope down here, however, the field here is twice as big as, as it is here, so this field dominates with the side field. So as the gyroscope keeps going round in a polar orbit, here it processes strongly one way, a little bit is taken away here, then it processes strongly again here, and so on balance there's a net precession in this way. It's smaller than if you actually set the gyroscope in equatorial orbit, but it has a great advantage that here, if you send the gyroscope in polar orbit, here the precession is about an axis at right angles. At right angles to the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the axis of precession is, is of course in the direction of the of, of the axis of the um, of the Earth's axis. So the, the gyroscope precesses about an axis like this, which lies, as I said, uh, parallel to the axis of the Earth, whereas the precipitant precession is in a, a direction at right angles to it. So the precipitant Precession is about an axis like this, the let's sync precession is about an axis like this, and the two are very easily, very easily separable. Um, in fact, if you calculate, if you had a gyroscope that sits here, the actual the gravity control B circles the Earth at something like 600 kilometers, if you had a gyroscope sitting out here in a, in a lattice, it would precess by 165 milli. This is incidentally a very important unit that is used, milli arc seconds per year. A milli arc, an arc second already is a very small measure of angle. A milli arc second is enormously small. In fact, since all these uh, measurements are, are done in milli arc seconds, I thought I would just tell you how you know, and, and the gravity probe B aims to be accurate to milli arc seconds. It aims to measure these angles of precession of a gyroscope to within a milli arc second. Now, milli arc second, uh, if you take the human hair, uh, how far away does the human hair have to go from you so that its angle is a milli arc second? The answer is 20 kilometers. If you take a human hair, 20 kilometers, that subtends an angle of 1 milli arc second, so that's the accuracy to which that program works. And it's, it's proven that you can work with that accuracy. Well, in terms of these milli arc seconds, uh, if you had a gyroscope that's actually fixed here, it would precess 165 million arc seconds per year. That would be an optimal position if you could sort of fix it above the border, but you can. If you fix it in the equatorial plane, it would rotate the other way, but the gravity magnetic field is weaker. So here, it would only precess 82 million arc seconds per year in the other direction. If you orbit it in a polar orbit, as I said, you have to, have to integrate it. Down here you get a big, big precession, down here you get a small one in the opposite direction. When you integrate it, the interest comes about 41 or roughly 40 million seconds per year. So the lens steering precession would be 40 million seconds per year, and the, there is of course also a precipitate precession, which is about 170 times bigger than that, 7,000 million seconds per year. Here's a diagram that shows you how the uh, Gyroscopes are, are arranged in the, in the gravity flow beam. Two main gyroscopes are like this. Uh, this is a polar orbit, uh, and this is the actual configuration. Of course, they're, not, they're, they're closely packed. 
But there's one gyroscope that measures the inlet string effect, and its rotation axis is at right angles to the orbit, and its precession axis is, of course, parallel, as I said before, parallel to the axis of the Earth. So this one gyroscope here measures the length string effect and nothing else. This is, there's another gyroscope whose axis of rotation is in the plane of the orbit, and therefore whose precession axis is at right angles to the orbit. So these axes at right angles, this measures only the length string effect, this measures only the lucidity effect, the bigger one. Then there are two more gyroscopes inside the satellite. And these two gyroscopes, well, there's a guiding star somewhere in the sky, the, and the telescope inside the satellite locks the satellite towards that guiding star. And there are two more gyroscopes inside the satellite, one rotating with and one against the direction of the guiding star. Each of these satellites contributes to both these effects. So each of these, the tail effect is measured by these three diagrams, and the city effect is measured by these three diagrams, but mainly by this. And as I said before, the accuracy which people hope to achieve is one milliard second. Down, accuracy to down to one milliard second, which is, as I said, one human hair at 20 kilometers. Uh, it's interesting that this experiment, it was called double blind. Uh, here's a picture of the, uh, of the uh, uh, schematic picture of, of, of gravity grow B. There's a telescope that rocks onto the guiding star. star. The guiding star was chosen, it's an iron Pegasus star in the constellation of Pegasus. It was so chosen because it's bright optically so that the optical telescope can lock onto it, but it's also bright in the radio spectrum, and that's very important. Because a star, a fairly nearby star with which you can lock your telescope, still has near stars in proper motions. The proper motion of this Pegasi, and I am Pegasi, what's interesting is the motion of the guiding star against the background of quasars. The quasars are so far away that they really serve as the standard of rest against which you want to measure things. But you can't lock onto a quasar. So what you do is you lock onto this very bright guiding star. And then you have to know how the star itself, what, what is its proper motion against the background of quasars. The guiding star emits radio waves, and these radio waves are observed by uh, Shapiro and his team at Harvard. And they, by now, have measured very exactly, down to one million second, the motion of the guiding star across the sky against the quasars. But they give you a secret. Nice. They don't divulge the secret, and the secret will not be divulged until Everett divulges his results. So what happens is Everett measures, every measures the precession of the gyroscopes against the guiding star, but that still is not the answer. So he can't cook his books. He will find an answer, and then his answer, Shapiro's answer, they have to be added together, and then you really get the precession of the, of the satellite against the background of quasars. So in that sense, it's a double blind experiment, and this dramatic moment is, is supposed to happen uh, next, uh, next Christmas. But I think we'll hear more about it uh, this afternoon and, and tomorrow afternoon. Um, here are some details, so stunning de details about this experiment. It's really a most incredible experiment when you think about all the incredibly interesting physics and engineering that we but again, we will hear more about that tomorrow. There are four gyroscopes inside the uh, satellite. Uh, very small, they're, they're the size of a ping pong ball. They're made of fused quartz. They're surrounded by a very, very thin layer of superconducting material, the uh, They're the most perfect spheres that have ever been made by humans. They're accurate within about 40 or something layers. Uh, they're spun up. Or incidentally, they, they, they function at cryogenic temperatures at 2 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and the satellite it takes an enormous amount of liquid helium with it. The satellite took 2,400 liters of liquid helium with it, which was used both to cool the machinery, but also once it had boiled off, it was used to guide the, to guide the satellite. The satellite was drag free. One of those four gyroscopes served as the proof mass. One of those four gyroscopes actually was the one that flew freely through space. The rest of it was just a shield. Uh, 
when when that incidentally the layer the, the layer of anchor between the gyroscope and its housing was no thicker than a piece of paper, so it's enormously close to its housing. Nevertheless, when that layer threatened to become less, there was a little jet of gas on the outside that propelled the uh, satellite. So in fact there was a guy in one of the four satellites uh, uh, was the proof mass, which in fact determined the orbit exactly. And then the jets of helium made sure that the satellite itself exactly followed that proof mass. So, and they were spun, spun up to a speed of a uh, rotation rate of 4,300 revolutions per minute. And as I said, the gas was then, the gas that was boiled off from the cooling was then used to work out of the exterior jets. And one last thing is, uh, the drag on the outside of the satellite was of the order of, you know, stuff hitting the, in the satellite, cosmic dust and things. The drag was something like 10 to the 8 of uh, Earth's gravity. Uh, the gyro inside was shielded to by a, a factor of a thousand better than that. So it was essentially for all purposes of the gravity. Now I would like to end up with these two remarks, one on Mark and one on, one on uh, gravity. Uh, as I said before, I think Mark, when you hear Mark, Mark Blitz for the first time, it seems so incredibly persuasive that once you've eaten this apple, you can't get rid of it. But it may not be quite true. Certainly, Einstein himself came to discard the Mark principle in, in about 1930, he said Mark should have discarded it. He never mentioned it again, although until then he was very keen on it. And of course, up to this day, there are many, many people who are totally sold on the principle. But I think I would like to investigate just very briefly whether Turing effect, whether the lens Turing effect is actually marked or not. So here's a picture of the Earth, uh, and the Earth is rotating. Here's the universe, that's the lattice, the universe is there, and the Earth rotates fast, and here, say this is a gyroscope that's going to be uh, at the pole, and it's dragged a little bit in the language dragging, uh, it's dragged a little bit different this way. And here's a lens Turing gyroscope also sitting also sitting in the uh, lattice. And that is precisely in the opposite direction. So this lattice goes this way, uh, this gyroscope goes that way, this gyroscope goes that way, in the opposite direction. So where does that come from? This is when the universe is there. What, what, how was it before the universe was filled up? Well, before the universe was filled up, this one went with, they were, lock, they were in lockstep together. So before the universe was filled up, the gyroscope at the center rotated just as fast as the Earth itself. So if this, if this little motion comes from this, this little motion must come from the big one here. And so the question is, in an empty universe, is there really much sense in saying, well, the Earth, which turns this way, makes the gyroscope outside of it turn very fast the other way. I think this is a sort of unlikely situation, uh, but it's just one indication that the mark may not be quite right. Uh, I have also a criticism of the idea of dragging, uh, and, and then, then essentially I'll finish. Uh, Einstein himself started this dragging idea, and as I said, in the beginning it's enormously crazy. The, the, the rotating earth drags in plane of the gyroscope with it, and Einstein used the word big phenomenon, drag. And then in 1960, Schiff was the first to brought gyroscopes back into the argument. And Schiff noticed that, uh, Schiff noticed that, well, as we said before, the Earth rotates this way because the gyroscope in the North Pole would rotate with the Earth, but the gyroscope out here in space would go the other way. And Schiff said, ah, yes, that makes very good sense. Uh, obviously, what happens is that the Earth drags space with it. Space is like a fluid. Space is just like a fluid. So the Earth drags this fluid of space with it. And because of one thing or another, it drags the space very fast near its surface and then it gets slower and slower and slower. So for example, if you think of space as being dragged by the Earth, uh, space is dragged fast, the velocity of space is big here, the velocity of this dragging space is even smaller here, there's a difference between the velocities because this is a bigger velocity and smaller velocity, the gyroscope actually turns that way. That's Schiff's idea of, of of a space drag, space being dragged by the Earth, and why these giants go the wrong way. Uh, you can find out quite easily how 
how the pattern of flow, of fluid flow, is to be in the space around the Earth. How does the fluid flow? Well, we know that the, we know that the um, rotation of the gyroscope is given by this, and you can work out exactly what the fluid flow is to be. But from fluid flow, we know that this omega has to be a half of the curve of D, and then you work it a bit, and you find that the, and the uh, hip form maybe a very trivial calculation in 1971, he found that the angular velocity of the fluid, the fluid being dragged by the Earth, has to be this. This is the omega, and that's very simple calculation. J is the angular momentum, angular momentum of the central body, and it falls off like R2. Uh, so Gibson said, this is, this is the flow I need around the Earth in order to give it precisely the red string precession here. And he said, ah, yes, that makes very good sense. And the first calculation he did is to take an infall into d -C. Here is a, in a different curve metric. Here you have a, this is not a different view. Here's a rotating Earth, and you take a, an infall into d -C. And if you take a part, you drop down to the Earth. And it's a very simple calculation. This is actually an actual DC equation in curves metric. And you start to drop the particle from infinity, and you solve this two DC equation, and you work out the rotating body at the center that deflects the incoming, deflects the incoming particle in this direction, the direction of flow. And you can find that, yes, indeed, it's, it's deflected precisely by this amount. So in other words, the rotation of, of shifts fluid around the, around the Earth accounts exactly for the amount by which an incoming to this is pushed sideways. And so Thorne said, well, that's obviously a very good indication that shit is right. And then came Bardeen and had another proof why that is right. And the way that Bardeen proved that this space writing is good, here we have the Earth. And Bardeen took uh, a set of mirrors around the Earth and sent a light signal uh, guided by these mirrors so this is the Earth, and this is the equatorial plane. He sends, uh, body sends a light signal in the sense of direction, in the sense, in the same sense as the Earth is rotating, and then he sends a light signal the other way. And he finds that one way you get the usual Schwarzschild answer, and the other way uh, plus this quantity, and the other way you get minus the Schwarzschild answer plus this quantity. So the, the phi by the t, the angular velocity of the light, seems to be given an additional an additional input, precisely of the right amount, precisely of this fluid that's flowing around. So on the way, on, on, in this direction, it's helped by that fluid flow. On the way back, it's hindered by that fluid flow. And that help and hindrance is precisely the amount that uh, uh, Thorne said. And, and so people think this is very good, and clearly the picture is right. But I think it can be right, because it's my last one. Uh, because uh, if you have a particle falling in, well, what I think is right is, is, is the electromagnetic analogy. That's the right way to think. The drag dragging business, although it's enormously persuasive and suggestive and everything, I think the dragging picture is wrong. But in any, and, and the electromagnetic analogy is always right. Take the infalling, uh, Kip Thorne took an infalling. GDC, and yes, he finds it pushed to the left. He never thought of taking an outgoing GDC. An outgoing GDC is pushed to the right. In falling this way, out falling that way. It's very easy to see why. Because uh, the B field, of course, on the way in is exactly the same as the B field on the way out. But the velocity of the particle here is in, and the velocity of the particle out is there. And on the way in, it gets pushed this way, but on the way out, it gets pushed that way. So if you have, if you have the space flowing one way, you can't push you one way on the way in and push you another way on the way out by exactly the same amount. And incidentally, these two things, the judicial equation, the exact judicial equation, the electromagnetic analogy of the system, because in fact the electromagnetic analogy is calculated from the judicial, so there can't be conflict between them. So this is certainly true. So I think this is, speaks against it. And again, uh, Schiff's argument that suppose you take, so suppose you have the Earth that's sort of in here. You take yourself an empty tube, there's a tube in the lattice that, that surrounds the Earth. And you have a little ball inside that tube. Well, the ball sits still, and if it sits still, nothing on Earth will stop it. Will, will start, uh, if it can't start to move, why should it move? Uh, it's it's at it rest in the EV field, and, 
And of course, there were belief forces towards the center, but that doesn't make it move around the tube because there's no Lorentz force acting on it, right? However, uh, there's a force, the, the moving space pushes, if you have a gyroscope, Schiff says the gyroscope, I is obviously the gyroscope gets pushed this way, yes, why? Because space pushes this material to particles, space pushes this particle hard, uh, the velocity pushes this particle harder, this is less hard, and so there'll be a resultant turning of the gyroscope that way. But if this ball uh, feels a force, and if this ball feels a force, why doesn't this ball feel a force? So I think there's something wrong with these arguments. I think there's something, I've actually always thought there's something wrong in Einstein, I think, also in the Indian thought that there's something wrong. However immensely appealing and persuasive Marx's principle might be, I think there's something wrong with it, because there's too many results that, sh that are anti -mind. And again, I think there's something wrong with the space driving paradigm. I think the only right paradigm is this idea of gravity magnetic and gravity electric field. That will always give it the right answer. And however persuasive these other things are, I think one probably has to discuss. And one very, very, very last slide, and then I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Total evolution seems to be too bad. Okay. 